Well, we want to welcome uh, our online crowd tonight, those who are watching online. We are glad that you are uh, joining us. And if you have your Bible with you uh, this evening, and I hope that you do, open with me to Revelation chapter 11. And tonight we're going to talk about the final temple and two prophets, the final two prophets. Uh, Last week, Stephen... uh, shared with you about chapter 10, the bittersweet book. And we, as I think Stephen shared with you, are at another one of those times in the book of Revelation that we call a parenthesis. Uh, I believe the book of Revelation is very orderly. It's, it's chronological. It's taking us chronologically through the seven years of tribulation that will begin after the rapture of the church. And we go through that judgment as uh, the, the worthy lamb, Jesus, took the seven-sealed scroll and he began to break the seals one by one of the seven-sealed scroll and God's judgment was poured out. And then when he broke the seventh seal, there was a pause, remember? And there was a parenthesis, kind of broke the chronology and we saw some other things that were taking place. And one of the things we saw that was taking place was that Christ sealed 144,000 Jewish boys, young men, to share the gospel. 144,000 Jewish witnesses. And so we know that while there's going to be great tribulation on earth and the church has been taken, that God is going to do a great work of revival among a group of people today that are largely blinded to the gospel. Uh, The Jewish people, for the most part today, do not recognize Jesus as their Messiah. They're blinded to the truth of the gospel, but yet their eyes are going to be opened. And we've read many scripture about that. And we see that 144,000 Jewish witnesses will begin to share the gospel during the Great Tribulation. And yet, while they do that, there'll be many that are being persecuted, but these 144,000 are sealed by God. They're protected by God. And so the parenthesis ended, and we began to see after the seventh seal, there are seven trumpets of judgment. And we saw the first trumpets of judgment, and then the final three were referred to as the trumpets of woe. Three woe judgments. And boy, are they woe judgments. We, We saw the unleashing of demons that uh, have been locked away in the abyss. They have been demons that are so uh, vile and deadly and dark that even Christ locked them up. They were not able to be here on earth for all this time until the, the woe judgment of the great tribulation and, and, and Satan was given a key to the bottomless pit and he unleashed them and they had the power to sting men like scorpions and men would want to die they would be so pain they would so much pain they would want to die but would not be able to die it's like a horror movie and then the the last woe judgment or the second woe judgment was four other demonic spirits that were unleashed to begin to bring together the armies that would come against Jerusalem beginning to assemble all that coalition of armies and forces that will come down uh, because of the drying up of the Euphrates River that will come against Israel in the last days for the battle of Armageddon. And now we are between the sixth trumpet of judgment and the seventh trumpet of judgment. And again, there's another parenthesis, right? And, And there was a pause last week to let us experience the emotion of the bittersweet book. And, and as Stephen shared that with you, uh, that, that eating of the book that was sweet to taste but bitter to the stomach, and, and that's the way we feel about Revelation, right? As I read the book of Revelation, isn't it bittersweet? Isn't this entire book bittersweet? I mean, it's sweet for us as believers to think about the return of our Lord Jesus Christ, our triumphant King, and that He comes back to rightfully possess that which belongs to Him. He comes to take His church and redeem this fallen earth. 
And, and, and we see the millennial kingdom that's coming. I mean, that's sweet. We see the marriage supper of the Lamb. The church in heaven with the bride, the groom. I mean, what a day. But yet, the bitterness of the judgment. We see over and over 21 series of God's wrath being poured out on unredeemed man. And we feel the bitterness of that. And so, when we read the book of Revelation, we, we capture that, right? What we read in chapter 10... That bittersweet book is, is what the book of Revelation is. It's bittersweet. And we should feel that way. On one hand, we should be excited and say, Come, Lord Jesus. Maranatha. You know, come. Let the Lord come. And on the other hand, we should feel an incredible burden for those that are lost around us. that are not ready for the return of the Lord. And so that pause, that little drama that you saw last week of the bittersweet book. Well, tonight... We're going. We're still in the parenthesis. We're still in the pause, and, and 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 every time there's one of these parentheses, we're seeing other things that are taking place during the seven years of tribulation that that are not in the chronological series of judgment. And what we're going to see tonight is the rebuilding of the Jewish temple, the final temple that will be here while we know time as it is now. And we're going to see two final prophets. You know, in Jerusalem today, the Islamic shrine that is called the Dome of the Rock resides on the Temple Mount. Uh, it's an iconic site. If you see Jerusalem, you see the Dome of the Rock. It's right there central uh, to, to the city of Jerusalem. And that's where the, the great Temple of, of Solomon was that's where the temple of Herod was. That is where the Jewish temple was until it was destroyed in 70 A.D. And, and the Muslims have built a, a shrine uh, there called the Dome of the Rock. And uh, nevertheless, Jews in Israel continue to make plans for the rebuilding of the Jewish temple. They, they are making plans. Now to talk about this before World War II would have sounded crazy because Jews were dispersed all over the world. And then during World War II, uh, we wondered if the Jews were going to survive. I mean, millions of them were killed in the Holocaust. It was another attempt throughout history to annihilate the Jewish people. The Philistines attempted it. Uh, then uh, during the Persian Empire, Haman wanted to extinguish them. Hitler came to extinguish them, but no one has been able to accomplish that, right? Because the sovereign God has protected his people. And after World War II in 1947, it was Hitler that God used to bring about the rebirth of the nation of Israel, a nation that had not even existed for, for hundreds of years, it was reborn. When do you hear of that happening? <laughs> when is a nation that has been extinct, been miraculously reborn? And the nation of Israel was reborn. And we've seen it grow and grow, and millions of Jews have flocked back to Israel, even though it's totally surrounded by its enemy. You might wonder, why would anyone want to go there, to a little tiny nation that is surrounded by people that want to kill you, and yet they go back. And they've already uh, begun to make plans for the rebuilding of the temple. Um, you can read articles. I would encourage you to go online and read about the, the Sanhedrin that has been reestablished. Uh, I think it was in 2004, the, the 71 council of the Sanhedrin has been reestablished. Now, they're not officially recognized by Orthodox Jews, but they're, they're, they're reestablished. Uh, the Temple Mount Foundation has already uh, has the blueprints for a rebuilt temple. They already have them. They've already raised the money for it. The money is raised. The blueprints are drawn up. The only thing they're waiting on is the land to be cleared. And that's a problem because the, the Dome of the Rock is there to, to destroy. That would bring war right now. And, and so, so they're waiting. And, and, and we know that at some point prior to the Great Tribulation, something will happen to make a way 
for the Jewish people to rebuild their temple. They're ready, they're waiting, the money is raised, the blueprints are drawn, uh, they're just waiting. And you're like, well, what's going to happen? How is, how is that going to, uh, how is that Dome of the Rock going to be removed? Well, I can't say it for sure, but how many earthquakes have we read about so far in the Great Tribulation? I mean, we've read about earthquakes that cause mountains to fall in the sea. So I think when God's ready for that temple to rebuild, He'll clear that land for him. Don't you think so? It, that that it, will, it will happen. And so in our text tonight, John is instructed to measure the rebuilt temple. So he sees a vision of it. So that we know it's going to be rebuilt. He sees a vision of it and he's instructed to measure it. And, and we're also introduced to two final Jewish prophets. There are two more prophets like Moses and Elijah. They're going to come. Two, two more prophets of God. Two more Jewish prophets. These are the final two. And we're going to read about them tonight. They're going to have great authority. They're going to be able to do miracles like Elijah was able to do miracles. Like Moses called plagues down on Pharaoh. There are two prophets coming that are going to have that kind of power and authority. So let's, uh, let's look at it, let's read it, and here's the main thought I want to share with you tonight, that during the second half of the Great Tribulation, there will be exceedingly violent and destructive times. The second half will be exceedingly violent and destructive. The first half of the seven, and a half, seven years, the first three and a half years will be a time of peace. The, the Antichrist is going to pretend to be a good guy. He's going to pretend to be uh, the guy that's going to be a savior. And, and many are going to believe that he's the savior. And he's going to pretend to, to bring peace between the Jews and the Arabs and going to act like he's got everything in, in hand and that he's coming to bring peace. But then the second half is when he will turn into who he really is. Uh, the Antichrist, the false Christ. And he will bring about persecution during those last half of the Great Tribulation like we've never seen. So let's read about it and then we'll dive into it. Uh, Revelation 11, we'll read the whole chapter. Follow along with me in your Bible. John says, Then I was given a measuring rod like a staff, and I was told, Rise and measure the temple of God. Of course, that temple doesn't exist right now. But it does here, right? So it's going to be rebuilt. He says, Arise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there, but do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. How long is 42 months? Three and a half years. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses. There, there's the two prophets. And they will prophesy for... 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. And that's 1,260 days is approximately uh, three and a half years. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord on the earth. And if anyone would harm them, fire pours out of their mouth and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. They have the power to shut the sky, that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. They have power over the waters to turn them into blood, to strike the earth with every kind of plague, as often as they desire. These are powerful. There's, there's nobody like this on earth today. These two men will be like Moses, like Elijah. And when they have finished their testimony, the beast... That is the first time the Antichrist is referred to in Revelation as the beast. We'll see more about him in chapter 12 and 13. But the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill these two prophets. He will kill them and their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that symbolizes symbolically is called Sodom in Egypt, where their Lord was crucified for three and a half days, some 
from the peoples and tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb. And those who dwell on earth will, get this, they will rejoice over them, rejoice over their death, make merry, exchange presents, because these two prophets had been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. But after the three and a half days, a breath of life from God entered them, and they stood up on their feet, they're resurrected. And great fear fell on those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies watched them. And at that hour there was another great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake, and, and, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe has passed. Okay, this is the, the, the fifth trumpet, I mean the fifth bowl of judgment, or the fifth trumpet of judgment, the second woe judgment. Behold, the third woe, which is the seventh trumpet, is soon to come. Then the seventh angel, here it is, blew his trumpet. The seven trumpets of God. That's after the seven seals. Now there are seven trumpets. The seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. The great hallelujah chorus was written about that verse right there, right? Uh, the kingdom of this world has become... The, that means that we're at the very end. I mean, things are happening rapidly now. The next seven bowls of judgment are going to come rapidly. And the kingdom of this world is about to become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ. And He shall reign forever and ever. That's the, that's the sweet part of the book of Revelation, right? We've been reading about the bitter. That's the sweet. And the 24 elders, that's us, the church in heaven who sit on the thrones fell before God, fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and was, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath came, and the time for the dead to be judged, and for rewarding your servants, that's the two judgments. The judgment of the dead, that's the great white throne judgment. And then the Bema seat judgment is the judgment of believers where we are rewarded. There's no judgment as far as wrath for us, uh, but, but there's the reward. And the time has come that the, the, for the dead to be judged and for the rewarding of your servants, the prophets and the saints, those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was opened. That's a different temple. And the ark of the covenant was seen within his temple. And there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, perils of thunder, and earthquake and heavy hail. Wow. <laughs> We're seeing some... Can you imagine John seeing these visions? Father, you are so good to reveal these things to us. The bitter and the sweet. God, we rejoice over the sweet, and Lord, our heart just feels the bitterness of, of judgment, and God, we care about the lost, and we pray that we can reach them while there's time. God, teach us tonight about these things that happen during the Great Tribulation. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. So the second half of the Great Tribulation will be exceedingly violent and destructive, and there are three things that we see uh, in chapter 11 tonight, number one, the final temple of the Jewish people. That final temple of the Jewish people is going to be rebuilt. And, and John is told to measure it. And uh, he, he's going to measure the temple, but he's not going to measure what's going to take place outside the temple because what's going to take place outside the temple is going to be the judgment and wrath of God. Now, I want you to realize that if the temple were to be rebuilt today, and, and I don't think it will be rebuilt until uh, the rapture of the church and when the Jewish people experience revival. Because if the temple were to be rebuilt today, all you would have 
would be more idolatrous worship. You would have Jewish people worshiping in ways that reject Jesus as the Messiah. But after the rapture of the church, when God's Spirit falls on the Jewish people, and as we have already read, all Israel will be saved, they're going to realize that Jesus Christ was their Messiah. When they rebuild their temple, they're going to be rebuilding it in the most pure way that the Jews have ever worshipped. They're going to realize that every time they, they think about all of the practices of priesthood, they every one of them pointed to Jesus. And they're going to know that with full knowledge. Every time they sacrifice, they're going to be worshiping Jesus Christ who was the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the earth. You know, Jewish people are very passionate. And when the Jewish people finally realize that Jesus Christ is the Lord of Lords and King of Kings, watch out world, right? I mean, they're going to begin to take the gospel to the, the lost of the earth. They're going to begin to worship God passionately and they're going to rebuild a temple that's going to be a beautiful example of, of godly worship of the Lord Jesus Christ. So don't think about the old temple worship and uh, the worship that occurred without the knowledge of Christ. Think about temple worship as God meant for it to be. Temple worship with Jesus Christ being glorified and Jesus Christ being honored and Jesus Christ being exalted and sang to, that's going to be what's going to take place in this rebuilt temple. In Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 12, Old Testament, hundreds of years before the first coming of Christ, Zechariah 12, 9 and 10 said, It shall be in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. So we know he's talking about a future day. When God is going to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And what do we read about in chapter 9? The four demons that were going to begin to gather together. All those nations that were going to cross the Euphrates and come against Jerusalem. Well, Zechariah writes about that. In that day, God says, I will destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour on the house of David. That's the temple. And on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Now realize they haven't even pierced him yet. He hasn't been crucified yet. Ze Zechariah is Old Testament. I mean, Jesus hadn't even been born in the manger yet. He hasn't been crucified yet. But Zechariah is already writing about the crucified Lord. And he's saying, they're going to look upon me whom they pierced. And the Jews were responsible. They're the ones that nailed him to the cross. And, and they're going to look upon me whom they pierce. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. So you can imagine their, emo their, their worship is going to be very emotional. I mean, they're going to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. They're going to weep over the blindness that, that they experienced for hundreds, yet thousands of years. And they're going to have a burden for reaching the lost. They're going to weep over the lost. Daniel, in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, Daniel the prophet in the Old Testament said, Then he, and we, we, we know that here he's talking about the Antichrist, the beast, he will confirm a covenant with many for one week. Now remember, as we talked about Daniel's 70th week, one week is a week of years. So he's going to have a covenant with Israel for seven years. But in the middle of the week, he will bring an end to sacrifice and offering. So what's the middle of a week of, of years? Three and a half years, right? So at the midpoint, he's going to break his covenant. He's going to break that peace treaty. And, and he will not be able to handle it anymore. Because he, the Antichrist, wants to be worshipped as God alone. He's going to make himself out to be God. And the Jewish people are going to be sharing the gospel all over the world. They're going to be 
worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. And it, even though he made a covenant for, with them for seven years, he's going to reach a point that he can't take it. He's a liar anyway, a deceiver. So he will break his covenant and he will put an end to their sacrifice, to their offering. On the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. We'll see it later when we get to chapter 12 and 13. But he is going to take over the temple. He's going to desecrate the temple. He's going to set up his own image inside the temple and say that you cannot worship anybody but me. Jesus Christ referred to this very event. In Matthew 24, uh, the great Olivet Discourse of our Lord, we have seen all through this study, if you've been with me, how, uh, how Matthew 24 parallels everything we're reading, right? In, in, in the book of Revelation. And Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 15 through 21, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, Jesus Christ, in his Olivet Discourse, refers to Daniel the prophet. So he's referring about Daniel 9, verse 27. So when, when you see the abomination of desolation, when the Antichrist sets up the image of himself and desecrates the temple and declares that you can worship nobody but me, listen to what he said. Jesus said, when you see this, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. So if you're in Jerusalem, it's time to get out. You need to flee to the mountains, he says. Let him who is in the field not go back and even get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant. Oh, how terrible it will be for those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. Pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as not been seen from the beginning of the world until this time, no nor ever shall be. So there's only one time that Jesus could be talking about right there. It's crystal clear. There's never been and never will be a time of tribulation like the three and a half years that we're going to read about in the second half. Of, of the seven years of tribulation. Never has been, never will be. This is when the Antichrist will break his peace treaty and unleash all hell on the Jewish people and, and really on anyone who professes the name of Jesus Christ. So the bitter sweetness of the book of Revelation is sweet. There's going to be a revival among the Jewish people. They're going to rebuild their temple. They're going to worship Jesus like they should have been worshiping him for the last 2,000 years. But it's bitter. Because the Antichrist is going to unleash all hell on the Jewish people. He's going to desecrate the temple that's been beautifully rebuilt. And he's going to bring persecution like the world has never known. So the final temple of the Jewish people. We see that uh, here in the book of Revelation. It will be rebuilt. Go home and do your homework. Look it up and you'll see that the plans have already been drawn. Uh, they're even searching for the, for, you know, we've read a lot about red heifers in the last few years. They've been, there have been some of them born. And the Jewish people know that when they rebuild the temple, they have to sacrifice the blood of a red heifer. You've been reading about that. You've seen that in the news. Uh, go home and look that up. Go home and look up the the money that's been raised for the rebuilding of the temple. It's, it's coming. It's coming. The second thing I want you to see is not only the final temple of the Jewish people, but the final two Jewish prophets. they are going to be two highly unusual men, not like anybody on earth today. They're not going to be false prophets. They're going to be, I mean, they're going to be true prophets of God. Maybe... Maybe it really is Moses and Elijah. I mean, Moses and Elijah are the two that came on the mountain of transfiguration, right? When Jesus uh, was transfigured. And so these two prophets could literally be 
uh, Moses and Elijah. But whether it's literally Moses and Elijah or it's two men that are like Moses and Elijah, that's really up to God's decision. But these prophets will be uh, two incredibly powerful men. Now, the, this is in addition to the 144,000 Jewish witnesses who are still out there and they're still carrying Christ to unknown to people groups that have never heard the gospel. In addition to them, these two prophets are coming uh, on the scene. And notice the description of these two prophets. Uh, there in verse 3, it says, I will grant authority to my two witnesses. They will prophesy for three and a half years, basically, uh, 1,260 days. And they're going to be clothed in sackcloth. Kind of like John the Baptist, right? They're going to be unusually dressed. They're, they're going to symbolize that they're calling the, the nation uh, that exists during the, seven, the, the period uh, during this time. They're calling people to repentance. He says, these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stood before the Lord of the earth. If anyone would harm them, fire pours out of their mouth. How about that? I mean, if you try to harm them, uh, you, you, you don't have a chance. I mean, they're, they're going to have power to, to bring fire out of their mouth to, to devour you. Uh, it says that um, if anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. They have the power to shut heaven. And so just like Elijah prayed that it wouldn't rain, uh, for three and a half years, it didn't rain. They're going to have the same kind of authority to do that as Elijah the prophet had. Uh, they, it says, will have the power like Moses to uh, bring plagues on the earth. Uh, that uh, no rain may fall. They, they have power over the waters to turn them into blood, to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. So they're going to have unlimited power. And when they have finished their testimony, the, the beast, that's the Antichrist, that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. But notice the beast doesn't do that until they have finished their testimony. Now only, they're, only allow, they're only overcome when God is finished with their work. And even then, God is going to use them. So we notice their description. And then notice their execution. When they finish their testimony in God's perfect timing, the, the Antichrist, verse 7, will kill them, and their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom in Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. So Jerusalem will become so immoral, and it will become so ungodly that symbolically it will be like Sodom and Gomorrah, and their dead bodies will lie in the streets where Jesus was crucified. Now, it says that when they are laying there in the streets for three and a half days, that people from tribes, languages, and nations will gaze at their dead bodies and refuse to let them be placed in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents because these two prophets had been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. I mean, that, that's just unbelievable. Now you remember, remember what we said about the 144,000 Jewish witnesses and who they're going to reach? They're not going to reach the masses of people that have had the opportunity to be saved because a hardening is going to fall upon them. And most of people in America and most people in prosperous nations that rejected Christ are still going to reject Christ. They're going to take the mark of the beast. They're going to worship the beast and they're going to hate the Jewish people. They're going to cheer the Antichrist when he turns on the Jewish people and when these prophets come, they're going to hate these prophets kind of like we see Christians being hated all over the world today. And, and many cheer when Christians are killed. They're, people are going to have dead's prophets day, right? They're, it's going to be like a new holiday. They're going to cheer. They're going to give each other gifts. 
unbelievable. With all this going on, people still reject Christ. Those that reject Him now will reject them then. As hard as that is to believe. And everyone will see Him. Now, if you read this years ago, it would be like, how in the world is that going to happen? But now, you can see CNN and MSNBC and, and I, I don't know if any of those news people will be taken in the rapture, right? Maybe I shouldn't have said that. But, uh, but they, they won't lose any of their business. And, 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 and they're going to have their cameras on these two dead prophets. And they're going to talk about how cruel they were. How they burned people up with the, with, with their, with, with the fire. Somehow this magic. And they're going to talk about that these religious fanatics... Uh, have been killed and now we can get on with our with our one world economy and with all the great things that we're going to see without religion in the world get rid of religion and and everybody's going to be looking at them i mean the cameras will be focused on them and and notice <laughs> notice what god does notice their resurrection this is going to shock the world right in verse 11 it says but after three and a half days, the breath from God enters them, and they stood up on their feet. And great fear fell on those who saw it. I bet it did, don't you? I mean, they've been exchanging gifts, celebrating the death of these men, and now they stood up on their feet. Oh, what God does. And I wonder what the news are go is going to do with that one, right? And, uh, I mean, this is going to be a day like no other. They are resurrected now, if you're lost, and if you think that when these two prophets are dead, well, finally we're going to be able to get on with the rest of our life. We're going to have this beautiful, socialistic, one-world economy, and everybody's going to have a mark on their head, and they're going to, if they pledge allegiance to this new globalism, well, you know, it's going to be better than it's ever been before. No religion just we're all going to be one, we're all going to be unified, and now we, we can get on with our life. And then when those boys rise up from the dead, don't you, they go, uh-oh, <laughs> uh-oh. I mean, things are not quite what we thought they were. I, I, I think at that point, they're going to realize this is not going the way we hoped it would go, right? It's kind of like you're in the third quarter and you think, We've got a lead, and there's no way they're going to come back. And all of a sudden, things begin to turn. And you're realizing what we thought was going to be victory is being snatched right out of our hands. And so we see the description of them. We see their execution. We see their resurrection. And then in verse 12, we see their ascension. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Come up here. Well, that's the same thing the church heard back in chapter 4, remember? Remember? John said, come up here. And, and, and so they're going to be raptured, just like we were raptured. They're going to be raptured into heaven. And they went to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies watched them. Uh, man, that, that's going to be undaunting. You know, Zechariah, again, going back to the Old Testament. Er, earlier we read it, where they are like the two lampstands that stand before the Lord. Well, Zechariah wrote about that in Zechariah 4, 11 through 14. Then I answered and said, What are these two olive trees at the right of the lampstand and at its left? And I further answered and said to him, What are these two olive branches that drip into the receptacles of the two gold pipes from which the golden oil drains? And he answered me and said, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. He said, these are the two anointed ones who stand beside the Lord of the whole earth. The two anointed ones. Two Moses and Elijah, maybe, that come back. These things may sound astounding to us today, but they're going to be so real. Uh, perhaps not too far from now. The last thing I want you to see tonight is the final trumpet of the Great Tribulation. In verse 13, At that hour there was a great earthquake, a tenth of the city fell, 7,000 people were killed, the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past, behold the third woe is soon to come. 
So the third woe is the seventh trumpet. You follow me? We've seen seven seals. Now we've seen the seven trumpets. The last three trumpets were called the woe judgments. Here is the seventh angel, verse 15, blew his trumpet, and then there was loud voices in heaven. And the loud voices are worshiping. That, that's the church. We're in heaven. Now we're going back up to heaven now. So remember, we, we read earth, and then we go back up to heaven so when, 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 when John goes back up into heaven, the church is realizing that we are at the threshold of eternity now. We, we are at the threshold of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. The seven years of tribulation is, is rapidly going to come to an end. And so the church begins to sing the hallelujah chorus, the kingdom of of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ, and He will reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders, remember, the 24 elders, the 12 patriarchs of the Old Testament, 12 apostles of the New, representing all of us. And so we're going to be there. You and I are going to be here on this very day. When we're raptured, we're going to be singing this song. We're going to be right here. And the 24 elders who sat on the thrones fell before God on their faces and worshiped God saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and was. You have taken your great power and you have begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath came. I feel like right now the nation raging, the nation's raging is already ramping up, right? Do we see the foreshadowing of that? All this rage that's taking place? Is it just the beginning of birth pains? The nations raged. Boy, they're raging right now, but you know more is coming. The nation raged, but your wrath came. And the time for the dead to be judged, that's the great white throne judgment. That's the spiritually dead. We're going to read about the great white throne judgment when we get over in Revelation 20. And so the dead, in, the dead who, who are spiritually dead, they're going to be judged. And then your saints are going to be rewarded. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. So we will not be judged. Our sins have been removed as far as the east is from the west. But our judgment will be one of reward. You know, we'll receive crowns that we get to throw at Jesus' feet. So that time is coming when the dead will be judged at the great white throne judgment. And all the saints will be rewarded at the Bema Seat judgment. The prophets, the saints, and those who fear your name, both small and great. So, I mean, I love that. You know, there are believers in this world that are not in the limelight. You know, they probably, you know, work behind the scenes and wash feet. And nobody knows them. Nobody knows the work that they do. God does. The Lord Jesus sees them. And, and they're going to be rewarded. He, he sees every cup of water that's given to the thirsty, he sees every time we clothe someone who's naked. He sees every time we visit the prison, we visit the hospital. He sees it, he takes record of it. And, and he says to his sheep, inherit you know, the kingdom that is prepared for you. And he will reward every work that has been done in his name. And so the time is coming for that. And for the destroying of the destroyers of the earth. There are those who destroy the earth with sin, ungodliness, and rebellion, and their time is coming. Verse 19, then God's temple in heaven was opened. And so this is not the temple that has been rebuilt. This is the temple in heaven was opened, and the Ark of the Covenant was seen. That's where God's presence is. That's where the promise of God is. And, and we're going to be reminded of that promise. And there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and another earthquake, and heavy hail fell to earth. And so in Revelation chapter 8, remember, it said, I looked and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blast of the trumpet of the three Angels who sound, the, the three woe judgments. In Revelation 9-1, the fifth angel sounded. I saw a star fallen from heaven 
to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. So the first woe is the unleashing of those demons from the bottomless pit. And then in Revelation 9, verse 12 through 14, one woe is past, still two more are coming. Then the sixth angel sounded. I heard a voice from the four corners of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the river Euphrates. And they're going to go and, and they're going to gather together that army that's going to come against Israel for the battle of Armageddon. And then in chapter 16, verse 1, Then I heard a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels, Go pour out on earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. And so when we get to chapter 16, there will be seven more judgments. <laughs> you know, 21 judgments, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. When we get to seven, chapter 16, it's going to be rapid fire, very fast, the final seven judgments of God are going to be poured out on earth but between there what is that next woe well in chapter 12 and chapter 13 we're going to see some real vivid details about Satan and Israel the the dragon who tried to destroy the woman that would give birth to the seed and, and that's what Satan has been trying to do from the beginning of time, is to, dis, to destroy the woman who gave birth to the child who is the seed. Who is the woman that gave birth? Israel, the nation of Israel. If you've ever wondered why have they been so persecuted, we're going to see that next week in chapter 12. And then in chapter 13, which may be the most, uh, not the most, uh, I guess, well-known chapter in the book of Revelation, we will read about the Antichrist, his false prophet, and Satan himself, the unholy trinity, Satan, his Antichrist, and the Antichrist will have his own false prophet that will be a, a false prophet that is the counterfeit of the two from God, and they will usher in a one-world economy, a one-world government, the mark of the beast, no buying or selling without that mark. We'll look at that. So the next two weeks will be this final woe judgment before the last seven bowls of judgment. Final thoughts. Do you see the end to which everything is moving? I mean, I see it already coming, don't you? All these things are falling into place. We're, we're not in the seven years of tribulation yet. But there is the apostasy that leads up to that, the falling away. And everything that we're reading about is falling into place, the rebirth of the nation of Israel. We, we're reading about globalism, secularism, one world economy, one world government. We're, we're seeing how... Powerful the government can control our lives. You know, I don't think mask wearing has anything to do with the book of Revelation, but what it is showing us is the government taking authority over our lives and telling us what we must do. I don't think a vaccine has anything to do with the book of Revelation, except we're seeing... The manipulation, if you don't take this vaccine, you may not be able to fly on an airplane. If you don't take this vaccine, you may not be able to go out in public. And so all these things are the beginning of the birth pangs. Government taking control of our lives and telling us what we must do or what we can't do unless we do what they tell us to do. And that is leading up to what will eventually be the Antichrist taking full control over everything when he says, you take this mark or you will not be able to buy groceries. You will have no milk. Your babies will have no formula. You have to take this mark. And so, do you see the end in which everything is moving? Do you realize the opportunity that is before you? What opportunity? The opportunity that we have to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. The burden that Wirt talked about, about these 15-year-old boys that have never heard 
the gospel, that, that if the rapture of the church were happening today, they'll be here for this. They'll be left behind for all this. You've got family, you've got friends, you've got neighbors, you've got work associates, that if the rapture of the church happened, they'd be here for all this. And, and you're afraid to witness to them? You're scared? You're worried you're going to offend them? Where are you going to offend them to? Hell number one or hell number two, right? At some point, you know, we don't want to be offensive. We want to be as kind and loving, as compassionate as we can possibly be. But at some point, we got to sit down with people we love and say, i got to talk to you about something. And, I, and we've got to share the gospel with them. In what ways are you committed to the work? What work? The work of the church, the work of evangelism. The work of making disciples who make disciples. The work of leading a discipleship group and getting your neighbors to read the Bible with you. Maybe even those that don't go to church. Guys, we cannot just keep doing business as usual. If we just keep doing business as usual, then we don't believe this book, right? This book calls us to action. This book is not just knowledge to be had. If this book doesn't move us into action, then what will? <laughs> and so, let's take this, and let's pray over it, and let's be burdened, and let's make changes. Let's make changes in the way we witness, in the way we work, in our passion to make disciples, because time is of the essence. There should be an urgency that we feel. And I pray that we feel it. There's a bittersweetness here. Oh, it's sweet. I look forward to being reunited with my loved ones. And I, I would love to see the rapture of the church because I don't really want to die. It'd be great to see my parents just by being caught up in the air with them. I, I, I think that would be awesome. That's sweet. Jesus is coming back. That's sweet. But it's bitter. Because there's a lot of people that are not ready. And we need to feel the bitter sweetness that the Lord is communicating to us in this powerful book. And we need to let it move us to be the people of God, the missionaries, the disciple makers that God has called us to be. Father, we thank you. This book is so detailed, so vivid. You did not have to tell us these things. The Bible could have ended before the book of Revelation. But you loved us so much you couldn't leave this out. God, you, you put this at the end to let us know where everything was headed. And God, is sweet. Lord, I, I'm so thankful that my Jesus is coming back. I'm so thankful that when He comes back, He's not coming back riding on a donkey. He's not coming back to be born in a manger. He's not coming back to die on a cross. He's not coming back to be a suffering servant. But He's coming back on a white charger. And He's going to have eyes that are like flames of fire and a sharp two-edged sword and a robe on His back that says, King of kings and Lord of lords. That's who He is. That's who He deserves to be. He's coming back to reclaim that which is rightfully His. And I'm so thankful that I have been saved by grace through faith. I'm a sinner, unworthy, undeserving. But I've been covered by His blood. And I'm so thankful that I'll be a part of, of, of His kingdom. But God, there's bitterness too. There's bitterness as we read about those that will be left behind. It could be some of our own children. It could be our parents. It could be our brothers, sisters, our neighbors. People that will be left behind that may not ever have an opportunity to be saved. But right now the door of the ark is open. The door is wide open. Whosoever will may come. God, help us to be your faithful witnesses. And to go out to the highways and the byways and to compel people. And to tell them to come now for all things are ready. You've made the way. God, people can be saved. We pray for revival and awakening right now. While there is time, Lord, burden us and, and, and use us for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.